final plenary session and indeed the final session of the 2016 Public uh, Law Conference. We thought that we would bring things to a uh, close by inviting four speakers to offer their thoughts and reflections um, stimulated by what they've heard over the last um, two or three uh, days. So I'll introduce them all now, and then they'll, uh, they'll talk to us, and then there'll be time at the end for further discussion and uh, questions um, if people would like to, to do that. So our speakers from my uh, left are going to be Justice David Spratus of the Canadian Federal Court of Appeal, Professor Cora Hoekster of the Waterstone University of South Africa, Richard Rawlings, Professor at UCL, and Professor Yan Chan of Hong Kong University. And so I'd invite Justice Stratus to uh, start. Thank you. Thank you very much. This legal conference is one of the very best I have attended. There has been so much very good here, and in the time available to me, I can only identify a few things. One of the things we took from our opening speakers, Lord Reed and Chief Justice French, and the discussion that followed is that conferences like this give us an opportunity to compare and contrast our legal doctrine and common law rules and ask why we have the approaches we do in our own jurisdictions. True, it has been said, we need to account for local conditions and that can explain certain approaches. But despite these, our shared Westminster and common law heritage means that shared relevant questions come up all over the place and we can constructively brainstorm on solutions. And as the conference continued with its unity theme, I found myself, and I'm sure it's true for many of you, making connections across broad areas of public law doctrine heretofore seen as separate. Questions, solutions, and connections, these are the seeds that grow into doctrinal evolution, progress, and the betterment of the public we serve. There are many examples one could cite at this conference, but let me just identify a couple that particularly struck me. Joanna Bell, one of many very young but very impressive scholars I have seen here, spoke on how we might characterize legitimate expectations encouraged by an administrator. Reflecting on her presentation, I rekindled and refined an old thought I've had but have not returned to enough, which is why Canada's doctrine of legitimate expectations is limited to procedural expectations only. And then there's Eddie Clark's thesis that standards of review for procedural matters should be aligned with standards of review for substantive matters, reminding me of our rather uncritical tendency to regard procedural matters as different from substantive matters. Yesterday's session with Johan Schon, Alan Beaver, sorry, Johan Chan, Alan Beaver, and Donald Nolan regarding the divide between public and private law in the area of torts left me with far more questions than answers, as did Ellen Rock's presentation on public law accountability and today Mary Liston's uh, fascinating presentation on the role of bad faith across public and private spheres. I've had to nibble on some of these difficult questions in my day job, but now I realize I have a lot more thinking and reflection to do. If only one could go back in time sometimes. Attending this conference has been like suddenly breaking out in hives. You end up having many itches to scratch. <laughs> but sometimes a great conference like this can reinforce and deepen one's views, leading to richer, more valuable views. A couple of exemplary presentations and papers did this to me, and I'll get to them in a moment. But first, let me say where I'm coming from. Amidst all of the complexity in public law, it's wise to remind ourselves of basics once in a while. 
Administrative law, of course, is the body of law that governs the relationship between the judiciary and their duty to enforce the rule of law on the one hand, and on the other hand, the executive's power to carry out legislative mandates. The relationship between the two, of course, is all important. An unduly meek judiciary gives the executive a free pass to ride roughshod over time-honored rights, such as decision-making based or oh, sorry, uh, yeah, it's a time-honored rights such as decision-making based on facts and logic, the application of standards of legality and conduct in accordance with procedural fairness. But on the other hand, an overactive judiciary trenches on the ability of the executive to act in accordance with the wishes of the elected government. In this tension, the judiciary has the final word. When a dispute arises, the judiciary must decide but how? How should they decide? This becomes all the more important in politically sensitive, controversial cases. In my view, judges must be seen to be drawing upon settled objective doctrine or the responsible incremental extension of legal doctrine achieved through accepted pathways of objective legal reasoning, not their whims, and idle thoughts, their own worldviews, their freestanding opinions of the moment about what is just, appropriate, and right, or their own personal sense of what in the circumstances is fair or nice. I'm in a jurisdiction where, in administrative law, we've largely left the nominate grounds of review and instead assess the procedural and substantive acceptability of decisions under a reasonableness rubric. The central doctrine that must be developed is the standard of review, namely the principles that determine when courts are justified to interfere with the executive. And in thinking about that doctrine, we must remember that the executive and its agencies are not a monolith, nor are the cases they deal with. They vary according to the circumstances and they defy easy categorization. So it follows that the standard of review must also vary according to the circumstances. In short, to use a phrase many of us know, there must be varying intensities of review. In this area, I was struck at this conference by the presentation of Marcelo Rodriguez Ferrer, who acquainted us with Wolf and Minister of Immigration, in which Justice Wilde acknowledged and to some extent define the content of variable intensity of review. Uh, he told us that while the High Court has been working on variable intensities of review, something that in my view lies at the core of administrative law and our understanding of the separation of powers, he reports that appellate courts are curiously silent. Now, Canada could not be further apart from New Zealand in terms of geography, and the quality of its rugby team. <laughs> but in this area, it could not be closer. Our Supreme Court often says, and recently has said in the Wilson case, that reasonableness takes its color from the context. But as Audrey Macklin pointed out in her presentation, the Supreme Court never, ever says anything about the context. I would add that while the Supreme Court seems to be suggesting that context matters, some on the court doggedly maintain that intensity of review comes in only two colors, complete non-deference or deference, whatever that means. It's as if they view it as an on-off switch rather than a dimmer switch. Yet lower courts in Canada, perhaps similar to New Zealand, have been working somewhat seditiously trying to explain how context might affect the intensity of review. In Canada, one might look to cases such as Farwaha and Bo Bogard. My view, silence on this topic cannot continue. If it does, we run the risk of passing into the solipsism of personal preference and individual ideological and idiosyncratic views. So what is the solution? Those judges trying to fashion doctrine rather than impression must continue, but it falls mainly to the academic world to do the heavy lifting, 
to enrich the doctrine and communicate it effectively to the thoughtful parts of the legal profession and to the judiciary. And here at this conference, we have seen some great heavy lifting, particularly in this area. I begin with Dr. Knight's brilliant piece entitled Vigilance and Restraint in the Common Law of Judicial Review. I do not think uh, that there has ever been a better exposition concerning the scope and intensity of review, a subject that, as I have said, lies at the core of a judicial review judge's task and our understanding of the separation of powers. And I look forward to his coming book. But that is not enough. To be stable and to be respected, doctrine needs a conceptual bottom, a substratum of concepts properly identified and appropriately arranged. In this regard, Jason Veruthas's article and presentation entitled Mapping Public Law is exceptional and deserves much study and further thought and development. Legal taxonomy, in my view, along with identification of principles and categorization of public law is overdue and necessary. Peter Burke's work on this in the public law yielded great dividends and the task is similarly overdue in public law. And related to this is a greater appreciation of the nature of administrative law and the values that animate it, the values that judges in this area of law need to draw upon in exercising their discretions. Here I applaud Paul Daly's presentation and article entitled Administrative Law, Characteristics, Legitimacy, Legitimacy Unity, and indeed his presentation at the last conference concerning administrative law values, the latter already put to good work in some Canadian administrative law jurisprudence. In conclusion, what must our destination be? Conceptual coherence begetting doctrinal coherence honed by learning from different jurisdictions unified by their shared Westminster traditions and common law origins? And what destination should we avoid? Doctrinal abdication, where all wallow com comfortably with words pleasing to the ear, like viewing things in context and balancing all the circumstances. I vote for doctrine. This conference, truly excellent in every respect, has inspired all of us to work to get closer to the right destination. And I offer my sincere thanks to all who made this conference great. Thank you. When Jason Veruas e emailed me to invite me to be one of the wrap-up speakers, he described it as an opportunity to reflect on the conference, the papers presented, and the conference theme. He also gave me carte blanche to talk about whatever strikes you as interesting. So you see, Mark, um, altogether an irresistible invitation. In my remarks this afternoon, I'd like to say something about all three the conference, the papers, or at least a few of them, and the theme. And I'll begin there. As anyone will tell you who has organized a conference, the theme is terribly important. A good theme is capable of inspiring potential speakers and other delegates while providing focus and leading to some degree of coherence and making it possible to construct meaningful panels and parallel sessions. The trick is to choose something that will channel papers sufficiently without constraining them too much or foreclosing on stimulating and challenging debate. Did you know that there are whole websites on how to choose a conference theme? <laughs> it's got to be relevant to current debates. It's got to be so interesting or intriguing that you can sustain the theme for the whole of the conference without boring people. It's obviously got to be multifaceted, which is 
particularly so if you're hoping to attract participants from a range of jurisdictions. And I think the theme of the 2014 conference, process and substance in public law, succeeded brilliantly in achieving all of those objectives. This one, I think the conveners managed something even better, or at least just as good, the unity of public law and that crucial and provocative question mark. <laughs> The theme inspired a wide range of papers that grappled with questions both big and small, and I'd like to pick up on a few of those big and small questions. A really big question is whether and to what extent there is such a thing as public law. What gives public law its unity, if any, and what distinguishes it from private law and other fields? A, a wonderful example of this type of engagement was Trevor Allen's paper on the moral unity of public law, which I missed. I had to read it before the conference because I knew that I was going to be busy talking about something considerably less exalted, uh, which is how difficult it is to <coughs> diagnose public powers and functions uh, in South Africa. But I did read it before the conference, um, and it is that type of engagement that this type of conference theme is capable of inspiring. Allen defended a, a united and coherent vision of public law that comes from a, a shared vision of liberal democratic constitutionalism, and more particularly from a connection between legality and legitimacy. Another big question that interested me is how different fields of public law connect with each other or relate to each other. And I was lucky enough to chair a session on administrative law and human rights, unity or plurality. It featured some fantastic papers which revealed contrasting approaches to this connection or relationship. Jason Varus's paper was about the importance and the value of mapping public law. And in developing a taxonomy of public law, he took a functionalist approach and distinguished between common law review, review on EU grounds, and human rights law. In contrast, Audrey Macklin cautioned against seeing the relationship as a choice or battle between administrative law and constitutional law, or as she put it, reasonableness and proportionality, or possibly deference and intervention. She argued that what's important is getting courts to be explicit about the considerations that really matter when evaluating exercises of discretion that affect fundamental rights. The third paper in that session by Geneviève Cartier also dealt with that intriguing decision of the Supreme Court of Canada in Doré, which purported to reconcile the regimes of human rights and administrative law by means of the methodology of proportionality. It can also, though, be regarded as recognizing the distinctiveness of each of those regimes. I must say that in this session, as in most of the others, I, a certain smugness infected me. I was reminded of the advantages of my jurisdiction, South Africa, where human rights and administrative law are not pitted against each other at all. Um, they don't have to be reconciled, simply because one of our human rights is a right to just administrative action. And to all you other jurisdictions out there, do... <laughs> Give it some thought, it could solve a few problems for you, including the problem of justifying judicial review. Turning now to administrative law more specifically, um, I am primarily an administrative lawyer, and so I was particularly interested in the papers discussing that area. And they provided a rich feast from the superb keynote address yesterday morning by Chief Justice Elias of New Zealand, to the final parallel session that we've just had. Actually, there was an embarrassment of riches. On Tuesday afternoon, I attended the early session on emerging issues in judicial review, followed by a later one on justifying judicial review, on both occasions re regretting my inability to be in two or even three places at once, as I missed out on other parallel sessions that I really wanted to attend and that also featured administrative law and things got no easier today. So I hope that the speakers um, in some sessions that I missed will forgive me if I focus on the sessions at which I was actually present. Um, 
Some big questions were raised explicitly in relation to judicial review. And here, I think Paul Daly's paper is a, is a great example. He tackled nothing less than the nature of administrative law, arguing that the um, growth of increasingly intrusive, uh, increasingly intrusive grounds um, and the legitimacy of all this judicial creativity can't be properly assessed without understanding the nature of administrative law itself, which he defined in terms of its openness, its contestability, and its dynamism. Sometimes big questions were disguised, um, big questions about judicial review at any rate, were disguised in other questions or were revealed in less direct ways. And here, Joanna Bell's paper is a great example. Um, she dealt with ambiguity in the doctrine of legitimate expectations, which is sometimes conceived of as being about constraining the power of public bodies and at other times about conferring rights on individuals. And she argued very cogently that awareness of this amb ambiguity is important. It, it can have practical consequences such as whether compensation is appropriate. Um, but it also raises a much, much bigger question about whether the unity of public law or judicial re review, in this case, lies in the distinction between legal power and legal rights. Some papers started with the theme of unification, um, particularly of administrative law, and then ended with the perception of disunity. I can think of two examples here. Um, Amanda Sapienza spoke about unification between systems today. She dealt with judicial review of non-statutory executive powers. Um, and she started off with the hope of taking inspiration from the UK cases on the subject, which have placed limits on exercises of non-statutory non powers. But she soon came up against contextual differences that militated against uh, what we called a neat transplantation exercise. Uh, by contrast, Eddie Clark this afternoon looked at unification within a particular system. He looked at Canadian administrative law, asking to what extent there's been convergence of substantive and procedural standards of review, and then going on to show that there's actually disunity in relation to procedural matters, in that the asserted standard doesn't always gel or necessarily um, uh, align with actual judicial practice. Another category of papers took disunity as the theme from the outset. For example, Thomas Adams thoughtfully addressed disunity in the justification of judicial review, denying that binary choice that you all have to grapple with and that we can just forget about um, between legislative intent and the common law, and arguing instead that there are plural justifications. Still others focused on disunity in administrative law across jurisdictions. I thought a lovely example of this was Janina Bohe and Lisa Burton Crawford's paper, um, which took the theme of Australia as an exception in administrative law as regards the distinction between jurisdictional and non-jurisdictional errors of law, a, a, a distinction that's been really abandoned or abolished in most common law jurisdictions, as they say, in substance, if not in form. I was very interested in their insight that rejection of the distinction may reflect a fundamental change in the relationship between the legislature and the judiciary. And that's certainly borne out by the experience in my own jurisdiction. Then there was a last theme I want to mention, which um, I, it concerns both unity and disunity, and, and I privately think of it as leaving the mothership. It's always interesting to reflect on the immense power and influence of English administrative law and the extent to which former colonies of the British Empire have been able to leave the mothership and make their own way across the universe. And sometimes, having done their own thing for decades, they return to the mothership either on a particular issue or more broadly. Um, and a, a fabulous example of that was uh, Marcelo Ferreira's presentation on New Zealand's administrative law moment, the Wolf case which offered an opportunity for New Zealand to align itself with the UK's contemporary approach to administrative law, um, but which he described as the last clear point of conscious alignment between the, the two jurisdictions um, as regards this, this area. Let me conclude with a few remarks about the conference in general. 
Um, as I participated in the first public law conference in 2014, and as I was given the honor of being on the advisory board for this one, perhaps I may also be allowed to indulge in a little comparison between the two. That one attracted about 170 abstracts, 200 participants from a dozen jurisdictions, and I think about 50 papers. This one was even bigger. I understand that there were close to 200 submissions. Certainly there looked to be about 220 participants from at least 20 jurisdictions, and I think every time I counted, I came up with a different number, but I think there were about 60 papers. I dare say it has not only been bigger, but also better than the last one was. The essential and I think highly successful format of the first one was very sensibly retained. But the conveners also managed um, a, a greater diversity in this, in this particular conference, both between um, delegates and in, in the range of speakers, and they introduced an extra layer of richness in the form of dedicated panels for doctoral students to present their work. I think the organization of the conference has been impeccable throughout. There's nothing to choose between this one and the last one in that regard. And the attention to detail, quite remarkable, from the call for papers all the way to the end. Nothing has been left to chance, and I think that is so often the hallmark of a really successful event. Of course, it's absolutely exhausting for the organizers and conveners, and we're extremely grateful to them and to the sponsors, Heart Publishing. Finally, let me say something about the social side. As we all know, conferences are just as much about seeing old friends and making new ones as they are about making space for new ideas and debates. The social side of this conference has not disappointed. It was facilitated greatly by that lovely buffet supper on the first night, the fantastic conference dinner last night, um, two lunches, any number of opportunities, albeit brief opportunities, to drink tea and coffee. And that brings me to really what is my only criticism of this conference. <laughs> tea time was always too short. In every other way, it was wonderful. Thank you so much. I want to uh, start by echoing sentiments that we've already heard expressed. I think it's been uh, a really super conference and um, I think it's been very enjoyable and I think it's been incredibly stimulating. And like Cora, I'm a veteran of last time and I thought last time was very good. I think this has been very very good. It's been, it's onwards and upwards, and uh, I, I really mean that. I think it's been great. Um, I wanted to uh, really group my remarks. I'm going to do something slightly different. I'm going to group my remarks um, about what has been, looking back, uh, and uh, then I want to um, say something about going forward and uh, Melbourne. Um, and my starting point, um, like Cora, I think, uh, was the uh, original call, um, and I thought that the um, uh, incredibly skilled um, call for conference papers, quote, the unity of public law, question mark, underline question mark, uh, unquote. And um, in the call, to remind colleagues, um, the very first thing we were told was that the theme is intended, quote, to be multi-dimensional and that the organizers welcomed papers from a number of different perspectives. And to save us some work, uh, the organizers then went on not to prescribe, but to suggest some possible perspectives. And the first one was uh, comparative divergence, convergence, etc. A second one was the public-private uh, relationship, uh, private law relationship. 
Uh, a third one, I'm just picking out uh, some of the major ones, uh, the idea of perhaps movement towards and can you organise the field around a common set of goals, ideas or principles. And then the fourth one about internal connections within our discipline of public law, administrative law and regulation, uh, human rights, constitutional law, etc. And it was interesting to me to watch how each of those perspectives played out. And of course, they're all enduring perspectives, and they were all represented in the conference by some very interesting papers. Um, it struck me that um, the, there wasn't so much emphasis on the relationship between public law and private law as perhaps there has been um, in other conferences, and certainly going back to the 1980s and 1990s, when so many of us in different countries around the world were thinking about privatization and outsourcing, and will there be any public law left at the end of the day, and all of that, um, clearly that would have been a time when, 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 when that set of relationships would have had a, uh, a, a particular twist to it. Um, and it was interesting to me that, 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 that there, were, there were fewer papers grouped around that area than perhaps I was expecting. Uh, on the other hand, um, echoing what Cora says, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm sort of particularly interested in administrative law, and I found the papers grouped around administrative law uh, particularly rich at this conference. And I suppose I, I, I derive particular pleasure from that because... Uh, administrative law hasn't been, shall we say, the most fashionable of subjects uh, in, UK, in, in the UK uh, in, in, in recent times. So it was, it was very refreshing for me to see that. And um, the theme that the, the perspective that dominated, I think, was the comparative one. Um, and the scene was set right at the outset uh, by a fascinating discussion um, between uh, uh, Robert French and Robert Reed, and then we were fortunate to um, listen to uh, Chan Elias the, 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 the next morning. And I think those, those three papers from very distinguished jurists uh, really gave us an excellent framework uh, within which to, to develop uh, that perspective. Of course, from a British perspective, uh, the elephant in the room uh, was Brexit, which floated in and out of the conversation. And I was particularly struck, actually, by a couple of remarks of Lord Reed's. Uh, he told us that the Supreme Court uh, hadn't yet got together to have a chat about Brexit. And I have to say that that rather surprised me because <laughs> I haven't yet met another group of lawyers that haven't done that. <laughs> um, I also was intrigued by his explanation for why litigants continued to turn up in the UK Supreme Court talking about the Human Rights Act when they could, brackets should, close brackets, be talking about the common law. And he gave us some interesting explanations for that. But I did think you can't quite gloss over the contribution of the UK Supreme Court to that phenomenon itself. Um, I mean, things have switched in the UK Supreme Court, clearly. But you only have to go back five years or so, or ten years, and you get to things like the Uller Principle, where um, there really was a terrific emphasis in the UK Supreme Court uh, on the Human Rights Act, and in turn, the very strong linkage uh, with the, uh, the European uh, uh, Court in Strasbourg. And I don't think that you can quite gloss over um, um, uh, the influence uh, of the Supreme Court's earlier jurisprudence uh, on the way in which uh, council are continuing to behave. Uh, and perhaps I might add, I, I, I haven't quite got the metaphor, but I, I it just struck me listening to Cora. Cora's uh, very kindly talked about the UK, or, or England anyway, as, as the mothership 
Um, I've been thinking about the UK as the prodigal son. Um, and uh, maybe uh, uh, future generations will, will, will want to be thinking about Brexit um, and whether they will be um, coming to the conclusion that after a little bit of the uh, more alluring flesh pots of EU law, um, UK lawyers turn back and uh, re-emphasise common law, old connections, uh, old origins. And we will see. Um, and understandably, Lord Reid didn't want to say too much about that at this point in time. Um, but clearly that's a, 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 a very live issue for us in the UK. Um, briefly on the, uh, the strategic use of the question mark, um, again, that flowed throughout our conversations. Um, in relation to uh, the use of comparative materials, I, I, I must say I'm, I'm rather on the sceptical side. Um, it does seem to me that there's a, a, a lot of scope here for cherry picking. Um, and again, um, it does seem to me uh, a lot of scope for uh, the use of comparative materials to justify that which you've already decided. Though, of course, Lord Reid told us, well, that would never happen in the UK Supreme Court, would it? Um, I think one, perhaps one gap there, um, which, which, which does come out of the conference, um, very strong in this conference, um, colleagues on the bench, and obviously very strong on the academic side. Um, we didn't hear, we didn't really have an input from leading um, practitioners. Um, and I think that would have been valuable. Um, for example, here, um, we know, uh, certainly in this, in, in this jurisdiction, that there is a certain strategic use of comparative materials going on through third party briefs, etc. And I think that's an important dimension of legal practice that, that perhaps went unrepresented um, in our conversations. Now what I want to do is look forward and I want to pick up following on from what Cora said about uh, diversity. And um, I'm told that what I'm about to say, um, something very similar set was said at the Obligations Conference um, uh, in the last few weeks. Um, and that doesn't dissuade me. Um, in fact, it reinforces what I want to say because I can't possibly uh, have, we can't possibly have the private lawyers ahead of the public lawyers uh, in any possible way. Um, so, thinking about diversity, um, I mean, it, you know, it's been absolutely terrific, I think, to see uh, so many women um, on plenary panels and um, in parallel sessions. Um, and, you know, all I can say about that is that 10 years ago, guys, it would have looked very different, even 10 years ago, and certainly 20 years ago. Um, and that's a, that's a, that's a great advance. Um, likewise, as Cora said, um, I'd like to really compliment the organisers for thinking about, if I'm allowed to dare, if, I'm, if I may dare say this, the new kids or the newer kids on the block, um, and really kind of encouraging, um, you know, sort of the new generation um, with all their creativity and ideas and leaving scope for them. And I think that's been terrific. Um, okay, what, 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 what's my concern? My concern remains about the representation of countries and the representation of jurisdictions. Um, as Cora said, um, done better this time than um, we managed last time. But let me just point out a few things. All the plenary speakers prior to this session have come from four countries. And it's the usual suspects. UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Those four countries accounted for all the plenary speakers. And of course, I'm looking at Eileen over there, and I know I shouldn't put the UK all together, and I've got to split up, and you know, whatever. <laughs> but the general point is there. Um, and then second, we have a little expansion here. We have, we have Hannes from, from, from HK. We have Cora from, from, from South Africa. Um, again, I did a very quick look at the parallel sessions. 
and all the speakers in the parallel sessions came, came from eight countries. The four that I've mentioned, South Africa and Hong Kong, and we can add in the US and Ireland. So all our speakers came from eight countries. Now, if we look at delegates, um, cause, um, you know has made the point. We, 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 we've managed to be more expansive there, and it's great to see colleagues from um, countries, um, important countries in the common rural globe, such as uh, Nigeria, um, or from the Caribbean, Barbados, um, Bangladesh, from that group of common law uh, jurisdictions, and Singapore, and I could, I could mention others, obviously. But again, I'd, I'd, I'd like to emphasize um, that there's still quite some way to go. I mean, I, um, I don't know if colleagues know this, but the University of Ottawa um, has a, what they call a jury globe research group. And they go around classifying legal systems around the world. And essentially, there are about 100 common law uh, countries um, around the world. And much depends, of course, on how you classify. And they have two big types of classification. They have what they call common law monosystems, where the common law is dominant. And then they have uh, what they call mixed systems of common law, perhaps with civil law, uh, customary law, Muslim law, Jewish law, etc. And roughly speaking, um, you can divide it uh, half and half. And so the point that I'd want to make here is that um, clearly um, it has become more diverse, um, but there is a very uh, considerable way to go. And I want to say that I understand that the organisers were a bit unlucky with their plenary speakers because they had tried very hard to line up a speaker from South Africa and... Um, uh, a speaker from India, but these things fall through and so on and so forth. Um, I make that point. Does it matter? Yes, I think it does uh, in all kinds of ways. Um, it seemed to me we were, we were talking um, about uh, the unity of public law question mark. Well, I thought we've got a pretty, uh, we haven't quite got the sample here uh, that we might like to have properly to address that question. Um, and uh, I also uh, know that one of the reasons for moving to Melbourne next time is an attempt, if you like, to bring the conference to other parts of the world and to open it up to uh, other jurisdictions. And I, and I really commend that, and what I'm saying is really uh, an attempt at a constructive contribution to that. Now, let me end by saying this. Um, I know, I understand the difficulties here, right? There are obvious barriers. One immediately thinks of finance. Um, and I also know that there are intellectual issues here um, in relation to comparative law. The more one broadens it out, um, how coherent is it going to be? Um, but looking directly at colleagues in Melbourne, um, I would like to say that I do think that this, this is an important issue um, uh, for uh, the future of these conferences, and I do hope very much that it's high on the agenda uh, for the Melbourne conference. Dioch, thank you. I suspect that the only thing between you and your dinner is probably this presentation. <laughs> and so I'll be brief, uh, and especially after three very distinguished speakers, the challenge is to find something useful to say. Um, let me first start by joining all my previous speakers in congratulating the organizers uh, for a very successful uh, conference, not only in terms of the quality of the paper, uh, but also in terms of how inspiring and stimulating they are. And I think in particular to uh, John, Mark, and Jason, and all the people behind 
and having run some of these conferences myself, I, I know how much work is involved at the back. And I think uh, all of them deserve a very big applause from all of us. I try not to repeat too much of what my predecessors have already said, and I agree with most of them. Indeed, it is very tempting to say just I concur. Um, and I think the theme is the unity of public law. Uh, and one big question mark is uh, what does public law mean? Where is the boundary? And how do we draw the boundary? Uh, the core of public law is reasonably clear, but the boundary is increasingly blurred. And as time passes, it becomes even more blurred than before. And so in this respect, and I share uh, the view that um, the, the great work done by Jason on the taxonomy project, I think it is very important. Uh, and I look forward to seeing how it develops. It clarifies the scope, the functions of public law. It provides us with a doctrinal basis for public law. And the two themes that he has identified, whether this is a constraint of powers uh, and whether it is a rights conferring. And to some extent, the two are in conflict. Uh, we have seen also other attempts uh, in the conference uh, trying to make use of concepts like accountability or good faith to bring the whole uh, area together. I think these efforts are to be commended. Uh, and at the same time, I think uh, what we can learn from private law is taxonomy is useful, but taxonomy has its own limitations as well. Uh, it is an exciting and useful tool, but so long as it remains a tool and not a master. The second uh, theme that I found throughout uh, quite a number of set, set, uh, sessions there, uh, some more explicit than the others, is certain tensions within public law. And public law itself is a fairly large area, but within this area, uh, there are tensions, uh, some more obvious than the others. Uh, and one notable tension is in the between constitutional law and administrative law. Uh, and one might even say that administrative law particularly the classic administrative law, our traditional view of administrative law, is pressurized from both left and right. Uh, on one side, uh, we have seen that uh, the boundary between constitutional law and administrative law uh, both come together in very broad term of judicial review is increasingly blurred, particularly after the emergence of Human Rights Act. And constitutional law in this regard has considerably changed the landscape of traditional administrative law. And underlying, and it appears in a number uh, of sessions, uh, it forced us to rethink about the functions of the court, uh, the powers of the court, as well as the functions and boundaries of public law itself. One example is um, until 2011, we have seen this, this very strong theme uh, that uh, the court still took the view that administrative law is to ensure the proper exercise of public powers and not to confer rights. Uh, and following this view, therefore, damages should not be a relevant issue in judicial review. But then, of course, our judicial review, when it deals with Bill of Rights, human rights context, constitutional rights, they precisely are to confer and to uh, protect rights, uh, rights that have been solemnized by state in a constitution or bill of rights. Uh, and in that context, damages should at least uh, be a possible remedies. Uh, and we can see this kind of conflict uh, in many other ways. Uh, the scope of judicial review has considerably expanded, and many ideas have found their place in public law. One just need to mention the profound impact of proportionality and legality, uh, not only in constitutional rights adjudication, but it uh, filtered into classic traditional administrative law as well as in many other fields. And at the same time, we have heard that notwithstanding uh, the common uh, nomenclature of legality and proportionality, they do take different colors uh, and different development and different meaning uh, in different jurisdictions. 
constitutional powers have also given rise to other issues about the role of the court. Uh, some jurisdictions like the UK and New Zealand confer only a power to declare legislation inconsistent with the Human Rights Act. Other jurisdictions like Canada and Hong Kong have conferred a power on the judiciary to strike down legislation. Uh, in either of these modes, uh, there will be issues uh, about disturbing the past or leaving a vacuum in the future. And this, is, this problem is more profound when there is a power to strike down legislations. <clears throat> uh, declaration that an admission process to a mental hospital is defective and violate the due process guarantee. The consequences, are we going to release all the mental lunatics into the community then? Uh, or a finding of undue delay could result in the abortion of numerous pending prosecutions. The past could be seriously disturbed. So could the future be. Striking down a statute authorizing covert surveillance would result in lacuna of law enforcement power that law enforcement agency could not live without. So this has led the court to consider prospective overruling uh, so that the past is not disturbed or staying or suspending a declaration of inconsistency so that the future uh, remains intact, at least until remedial legislation has been introduced. But these powers raise a fundamental and central issue is what exactly is the role of the court? Does the court have that power? Uh, and Australian court has been moving very cautiously. Prospective power or prospective overruling goes well beyond the scope of the judiciary. Other jurisdictions found that as a matter of practical necessity, this power should, be, uh, 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 should exist, although it should be exercised with great exception and only in exceptional circumstances. Other jurisdictions find that it is not an issue at all. Uh, and, <clears throat> and, and all these, as the Antin Masons uh, mentioned in one recent case, is that uh, the, the role of the court cannot be considered in abstract. It has to be considered within the constitutional relationship between the judiciary, the executive, and also the constitutional history of the particular jurisdictions. On the other side, we have seen uh, the proliferation of administrative adjudication coupled with broad and extensive statutory discretionary power, uh, which threaten, uh, if that is too strong a word, at least challenge the jurisdictions of judicial review. And in the opening speech by Chief Justice uh, Elias, uh, she pointed out the emergence of this extensive administrative adjudication, particular expert tribunals, uh, and that may curtail the scope of judicial review. Uh, and it is true, of course, public law is not just about the court, uh, but what are the proper relations between administrative adjudication, which could come in a variety of forms, sophistications, and powers, and sometimes with draconian uh, power to make uh, far-reaching decisions and consequences on individuals or ordinary citizens. From another perspective is the court has traditionally jealously guard against uh, any statutory encroachment of its jurisdictions. Uh, one just need to think about the long line of authorities following from the animistic decision. But are we facing another challenge of executive encroachment of judicial jurisdiction through administrative adjudications and through the notion of deference? Uh, the whole idea of deference, again, has come up in a number of decisions, and this would be one area that I would like to see more discussions, uh, both theoretical and practical. And I echo also some of the speakers mentioned, uh, and in this area, context is important, but what exactly do we mean? And I'm attracted by uh, Audrey Mappin's idea uh, that we have to identify a few criteria uh, and context is probably too vague uh, and unsophisticated enough to deal with this matter and other issues, transparency, quality of decisions, reasons, structure of decision-making process are all relevant uh, and it is not just the expertise knowledge, but expertise knowledge may not be the only criteria in determining how far judicial review should go. And finally, we are then taken back to the public law, private law divide. Uh, I expect this issue to be raised, uh, and it is not as extensive as I have thought. Uh, but in the last few sessions, and 
Um, we have seen issues about increasingly there are public interest in private law, uh, and we have uh, one presentation of uh, a few presentations, private law lawyers, and I always find that there are insufficient dialogue between public law and private law, as if two are two distinct world, uh, and we can't understand one another. But increasingly, uh, and at least among private lawyers, there are extensive discussions about issues like vindicatory damages in public law, is Human Rights Act a statutory tort, uh, and how about public interest in private law issues. Uh, and these are issues which public lawyers should probably engage. Uh, and we have also uh, interesting papers uh, on re rethinking about some of the private <coughs> law, uh, malicious prosecution, misfeasance of public office, or punitive damages. Are they really private law issues? And they are private law simply because they exist well before the dawn of pro public law. Uh, but almost in any perspective, these areas or these, this kind of thoughts uh, would probably be better understood from a public law perspective than a private law perspective. But what are the implications then? And we have also heard papers about the increasing and quite extensive use of non-statutory powers, uh, which challenge the traditional thinking of judicial review, which stems from ultra-virus and uh, statutory base and use of statutory powers. Uh, and how are we going to deal with the whole range of non-statutory powers? So these would bring us back again uh, to the classification and possibly bring us back to the taxonomy project. We need to know where exactly uh, is the outer boundaries of public law, where to draw the dividing line between public law and private law. So um, just to end the presentation, I think it has uh, many great ideas has come and many ideas deserve a lot more thinking. And it shows us how rich the subject of public law is. It also reminds us how ignorant we still are about the area. <laughs> And good conferences always raise more questions than you can answer, uh, and this is exactly uh, what this conference has done. So I look forward to continue our exploration of the subjects in the next conference uh, in Melbourne. And just one final uh, was about the next conference. I echo what Rick has said about uh, um, I would it would be great to see the perspective of private practitioners uh, and the way they deal with uh, cases. And sometimes I find that uh, some of the judgments could not be explained until you know why or how the case was argued. Uh, and there sometimes are reason why a case is argued in that particular way. Uh, I've mentioned that uh, the, the issue of deference is probably something we need to look uh, um, in further. Uh, and when the conference is to be held in Melbourne. Uh, and I also echo the point that uh, some of the smaller jurisdictions are uh, worth representing, uh, and in particular, the issues faced by small jurisdictions like Hong Kong or Singapore uh, would be quite different from some of the largest jurisdictions. For example, in small jurisdictions like Hong Kong, we never have problems with reception of comparative materials. We just need that. Uh, and <laughs> so uh, with this, I, I look forward to uh, the next conference uh, in Melbourne. Thank you. Thank you.